today we're talking about the European Renaissance. The Renaissance affected all of Europe, but the main contributors to the movement were Italy, France, and England. As a cultural movement, it encompassed a flowering of literature, science, art, religion, and politics, and a revival of learning based on classical sources, the development of linear perspective in painting, and gradual but widespread educational reform. Humanism was the basis of the Renaissance. Humanist education was based on the study of five humanities, poetry, grammar, history, moral philosophy, and rhetoric. The general definition of humanism movement was to recover, interpret, and assimilate the language, literature, learning, and values of ancient Greece and Rome. Above all, humanists asserted the genius of man, the unique and extraordinary ability of the human mind, which contrasted with the medieval concept of the world, which was the focus on God and Christianity. Now the importance of man as the highest form of creation was stressed. The value of the human in the exploration of classical civilizations became parallel concerns along with the elements of Christianity. The Renaissance was a period of rebirth. During the medieval period, the emphasis was on verticality, reaching for God. Now during the Renaissance, the emphasis was on symmetry and horizontality, being equal to God. A big part of the Renaissance was the theory that beauty could be incorporated through spatial movement, that spaces could be designed through calculated mathematical ratios. Part of the ratio was the measure of the human body and its proportional relationships. So looking at the three areas, the Italian Renaissance happened from 1360 to 1600, the French Renaissance happened from 1450 to 1600, and the English Renaissance happened from 1500 to 1660. People you may have heard of that were alive during the Renaissance are Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, Brunelleschi, Donatello, Andrea Palladio, Lorenzo de Medici, Oliver Cromwell, William Shakespeare, and Inigo Jones. First, we're going to look at Italy. Italy during the Italian Renaissance. The word Renaissance means rebirth. This is the word used to characterize art and architecture from the mid-1300s to the mid-1600s in Europe. The Renaissance of architecture and art started in Italy. All other countries surrounding Italy had adopted the transition from Romanesque and Gothic style into the Renaissance style. Italy had not adopted the Gothic style, so it was easy for them to return to the classical antiquities of the ancient Greeks and Romans surrounding them. So, like the Romans, the Renaissance architects used the orders, or columns, in a similar way for structure and decorative purposes. The typical architect did much more than just build during this time. He would also be a painter, a sculptor, and a furniture designer. There were two important things that happened during the Italian Renaissance. The first was the rediscovery of the treatise on architecture by Vitruvius, who was a Roman architect. The second was that there were available models from the classical antiquity in Italy, and this had been at the center of the Roman Empire. The treatise, which was 10 books on architecture by Vitruvius, inspired other architects to write other architectural treatises. Vitruvius is famous for asserting in his book that a structure must exhibit the three qualities, that is, it must be strong or durable, useful, and beautiful. 
According to Vitruvius, architecture is an imitation of nature. As birds and bees build their nests, we humans construct housing from natural materials. This gives us shelter against the elements. When perfecting this art of building, the ancient Greeks invented the architectural orders, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns. It gave them a sense of proportion and building from the proportions of the greatest works of art, the human body. This led Vitruvius to create his Vitruvian Man, as drawn later by Leonardo da Vinci, the human body inscribed in the circle and the square, the fundamental geometric patterns of the cosmic order. Andrea Palladio devoted his career solely to architecture. He was the most prominent architect of the later 16th century. Palladio used classical motifs in his designs, but in a different way than they were originally used by the ancient cultures. Palladio broke the rules of the ancients he studied, which had been blindly accepted by people as the accurate depiction of the ancient cultures. The style of Inigo Jones, an English architect in the early 17th century and the leader of the English Palladian movement around 1715, were influenced by the works of Palladio. Artists during this time were employed by a patron. They were hired on a long-term basis where they would provide a variety of design services. People of high status would compete for the services of the talented artists. Those of high society had to promote the arts out of civic duty, social obligation, and also to represent their power. Now moving on to France. The Frenchmen had many opportunities to see the Italian Renaissance styles with Charles VIII's military expedition into Italy. These began in 1485 which started the influence of the Italian Renaissance on the French arts. French noblemen of military expeditions in Naples observed Italian art, decor, architecture, and as well the patronage for their arts. This inspired the French aristocracy with a new attitude to, towards the arts and artists. This time was considered the beginning of the French Renaissance. King Francis I had an enthusiasm for the arts. He employed Italian artisans and had Frenchmen travel to Italy to study art at the height of the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci, Francesco Primaticchio, Benvenuto Cellini, and Sebastiano Serlio were all Italian artists that were brought into France. Serlio wrote a book on architecture which caught King Francis's attention, so he was brought to France under employment of the crown. This allowed for widespread adoption or acceptance of the classical arts in France. The French aristocrats learned how supporting the arts could influence their status politically and socially. More military activities in Italy encouraged the Italian Renaissance movement in France and among the French people. Francis I was adamant about this style and about bringing this style to France. The Gothic style had widely been accepted in France, so there was a transitional period before things were fully expanded into the Renaissance style. During the transitional period, new Renaissance decorative motifs were first applied to medieval forms or they would modify medieval structures to have some of the characteristics of the Renaissance style. The Renaissance style was in full swing and had its highest development in the period of 1575. When Henry II died in 1559, a 30 year strife began. There were religious wars involving the Huguenots, or French Protestants, and the Catholics, which was the first religion of France. Many Huguenots were architects and craftsmen who had contributed considerably to the arts of France. 
During the massacres, many Huguenots fled from France to England and to the Netherlands. This impacted the arts of both of these countries. The Gallery of Francois I at Fontainebleau, built between 1534 to 1539, is the most striking example of the new kind of interior decoration introduced into France by Italian artisans like Primaticchio. The lower portion of the walls is decorated with traditional oak paneling. Above, stucco reliefs alternate with allegorical frescoes. The gallery ushered in the style known as the School of Fontainebleau. In 1598, Henry IV, the first Bourbon king, issued the Edict of Nantes. This ended the war and would define the rights of Protestants to have private worship. This allowed those exiled artisans to return again to France. There had been little to no building activity for those 30 years. But when building began again towards the end of this century, there was a tendency to create exaggerated forms and greater elaboration as a reaction to the previously straightforward and simple forms which we will see extend into the French Baroque. There were three types of houses being built at this time in France. The first is the chateau or castle, and it's where country, where country places for aristocracy typically it has an irregular outline and fortified by a surrounding wall, also encompassing moats, drawbridges, and circular towers. The next type of house is the manor house which is different from a castle because it has no fortification, and, but it could have a moat or a wall. And the third type is the townhouse, and it's designated according to social class, including a central court with buildings on one or more sides, and a screen wall where the entrance was to separate the house from the street. And there were two types of townhouses. The first is a hotel, and it's typically where the wealthy merchants and professional men lived. And the second is a maison, and it would be where the middle to lower class would occupy. After the transitional period, the French started incorporating symmetry, rectangular plans, and uniform spacing into their interiors. French were more likely to keep Gothic details or elements in their designs as opposed to the Italians. The French were less knowledgeable about classical design. Although the French were more aware of the impact of construction as an influence on design. The gallery of Francois I at Fontainebleau is the most striking example of the new kind of interior decoration introduced into France by Italian artists. Here you can see an example of Fontainebleau and the gallery has 12 narrative frescoes, sculptural relief borders, and carved walnut wainscoting. Moving on into England, there were two lines of monarchs in command during this time. The Tudors, which were English rulers, and the Stuarts, which were Scottish rulers. The Tudor monarchs began with Henry VII and ended with Elizabeth I, and there were a total of five Tudor monarchs during this time. The beginning of the Tudor reign which was Henry VII, was considered medieval. The middle of the Tudor reign, which was Henry VIII, was considered a period of transition from medieval to Renaissance. The construction of the Somerset home was very influential in the advancement of the English Renaissance during Elizabeth's reign, who ended the Tudor reign. This time was also known as the Shakespearean or Elizabethan era. 
Henry VIII was a patron of the arts and he employed Italian artists to come to England to inspire the adoption of the Renaissance style. Henry VIII also caused much controversy during this time and even after his death during the Elizabethan era that followed. Henry VIII started the Church of England when the Catholic Pope denied his annulment to Catherine of Aragon, which was Queen Mary's mother, because he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, who was Elizabeth's mother. This then separated him from Rome and the Roman Catholic Church, therefore separating the English people as well. Other ramifications of this were the dissolution of the monasteries, which supported the arts. Henry then split up the land that was under monastery control and sold them to private families. Large amounts of building and renovations started during this period as people felt free to spend their money on secular things like furniture or luxuries, or basically anything outside of the church. Although this did create a decline in the standards of craftsmanship for furniture makers, as the monasteries had set the standards and supervised the craftsmen. Education became the focus rather than crafts. One result was libraries being added to buildings. Once Elizabeth came into control, she had to deal with the debt her father, Henry VIII, had created, and also with the alienation from Rome as Catholics were not allowed to worship freely in England. There was prosperity during Elizabeth's reign. The Stuart monarchs, James I and Charles I, is also known as the Jacobian period. Inigo Jones began his stylistic development in the early 17th century in both Baroque and in High Renaissance models. He began to study Andrea Palladio and brought back the Palladian style. During this period, England prospered from the advances in foreign trade and industry. This helped bring influences from other countries. A new class arose with an appreciation for more luxurious items. Designers seen in German and Flemish pattern books provided a new basis for interpreting the Italian Renaissance. Pattern books, probably similar to what we have in magazines today, showing the new and interesting styles of design being developed around the areas, like Italian Renaissance and French Renaissance. Inigo Jones is credited with bringing England the pure Italian Renaissance style as opposed to a Jacobian hybrid style. Jones studied Palladio and the Italian system of proportions so he could accurately portray those in his work. The big difference from Gothic to Renaissance was the Gothic period was a collaboration of artists coming together to create a piece or structure and the design revolved around the material being used, whereas in the Renaissance a single individual made a piece or structure and the design was made regardless of the material choice. In England the Renaissance period is also called Elizabethan or Jacobian style. A style to compete with these is the Cromwellian style, which has an emphasis on simplicity rather than comfort or extravagance. This was due to the religious nature of the Puritans. In the Cromwellian period, named for Oliver Cromwell, an English military leader, he was the leader of the Puritans who overthrew the English monarchy and temporarily turned England into a Republican Commonwealth. The spatial relationships throughout this period offered different types of housing being built depending on the wealth of the person. 
city palaces showed the wealth of the citizen as well as country villas being built for relaxation. Also, the need for greater privacy influenced the arrangement of interior spaces. Rooms needing greater privacy were set further from the main entrance. Since the Italians liked symmetry, most homes were rectangular with rectangular or square rooms. Occasionally rooms would be round or octangular. There would be a guard at the entrance to the home, and once within the home, the innermost rooms would be connected through doorways rather than corridors. The bedchamber was a central space in an apartment and could have many uses during the day as a reception room for a wedding, offering the presentation of a new baby, or even as a drawing room. The studio or closet would be the most private and only cherished friends of the owner or someone deemed appropriate would be allowed in this space. Renaissance artists started to create optical illusions with the trompe l'oeil painting style, with painting of landscapes, cities, figurative motifs, and religious themes, as well as illusional architectural details like loggias, niches, doors, vaults, and even columns. Also, they might have tiers of perspective paintings combined with marquetry. The materials and decorative techniques used. Interiors of later Renaissance included a combination of media. Media included oil and fresco painting, carved marble, and stucco reliefs. They used intarsia, which was shaped pieces of inlay material set into ground material. They used marquetry, which is a veneer technique where pieces of wood, shell, and ivory are fitted together as a continuous surface on a core of less expensive material. They also used fresco, which they used to paint the perspectives that gave many Renaissance walls and ceilings the illusion of spatial extension. And they also used fresco secco, which prevented color change over time. More attention was given to ceremony than comfort, forms were forceful and precise, lines were clear and concise, nothing was ambiguous, cubic forms were used throughout. Terracotta and majolica were the ceramic materials most often used on their floors. Brick was seen in lower class houses, stone was used in public buildings and had limited uses in homes. Marble, granite, serpentine, and porphyry were also used. During this time, coordination of the entire scheme was important, so the relationship of the architectural elements was looked at, and the floor design usually mirrored the ceiling. Looking at the wall divisions, the data was the lower part of the wall, then there was a main field, and then a decorative frieze with a complete entablature or cornice above the decorative frieze. The painting techniques used on walls most often were plastered, whitewashed, or painted with color. Plaster was also used as a base for a mural or patterns in fresco, and stucco relief was sometimes combined with fresco. Movable hangings like tapestries were used for decorative enhancement. Some covered entire rooms hung from the ceiling to floor. Wood, plain or decorative, most commonly enhanced with marquetry, sometimes painted with oil and pigments was seen. Wall treatments using antique classical ornament were used frequently including the grotesque, which includes motifs such as the Sphinx, representative of portions of human and animal figures, 
monsters, and medallions interwoven with foliage and flowers and line. Another ornament is the arabesque, which is a combination of plant and animal forms arranged in an intertwining manner, and the candelabrum, which is generally a decoration in the border. Looking at their windows and doors, important houses incorporated glazed windows. At first, window openings were round-headed, but by the third quarter of the 15th century, the windows had rectangular frames. Throughout the Renaissance, moldings, entablatures, and pilasters were added around the windows. Casement windows that opened became common. Doorways could have very lavish or extravagant detail. The detail was related to the importance of the room. Symmetry was very important during this time and often fake doorways would be painted opposite real doors. Chimney pieces became one of the focal points of the room and often was at a huge scale. Vincenzo Scamazzi established sizing guidelines for fireplaces. Ceilings could be flat, vaulted, or coved. A vault ceiling could be done in a barrel or a tunnel vault. A cove ceiling was often an intermediate ceiling and had a concave transition from the wall to ceiling. They still incorporated coffered ceilings which were based on Roman designs. Ceiling painting is done in important rooms and was the dominant feature in the second half of the 16th century. There was often a strong separation of wall and ceiling by incorporating a cornice. Looking at furniture at this time, rooms were sparsely furnished. Furniture was massive and very ornate and decorative techniques required very skilled craftsmen. The use of the column, one of the most characteristic features from Greek and Roman architecture, is now incorporated into the furniture design. Caryatids, or columnar supports in the shape of the female figure, were especially popular. They often had many construction techniques. Different types of woods were used to achieve different colors. Mortise and tenon joints were still used, as well as dovetail joinery. Two inlay processes, intarsia, which is the inlay of multicolored woods, and certisocena, which is the inlay of bone and ivory. Carving was the preferred decoration for furniture. There was incised carving where the design was flush without surrounding, or excuse me, with surrounding wood. And then there was chip carving, which was small unconnected gouges using different motifs. Then there was pastiglia, which is ornamentation where gesso was cast into molds and applied to furniture or painted directly onto the furniture where designs were carved while it was still wet. Turning was used for finials, bedposts, and furniture legs. Seat furniture became available to everyone. In Italy, the Savonarola, Scabella, Pancetto, and Casapancha were popular seating types. X-type chairs were the Savonarola and Dante chair, and these were based on Roman prototypes. Other chairs commonly used were rectilinear with tall cushion backs and cushion seats. The Scabello is an armless back stool carried over from the 15th century with a fan-shaped back. There's also an example in your book on page 109. The pancetto chair is similar to the scabello, but it only has three legs. The casa pancha is a multi-seat unit that is also served as a chest. Looking at Francis seating, there were two styles seen. Francis I, which is from 18 
or excuse me, 1483 to 1547, and Henry II, which is 1547 to 1589. Francis I's medieval forms with Italian Renaissance and Gothic motifs were seen. And Henry II, French designers modified new forms to make them their own style. Ornamental detail showed classical ideals. Design centered on comfort, elegant styles, and new art influences. Architectural features that were applied to furniture were entablatures, pilasters, pediments with classical moldings, carved decorative details, and curatives. They also showed nudes in high relief, which followed strict classical rules. And there was also the cacatoire or gossip chair seen in France, and it had a wide trapezoidal seat to allow for women large skirts. In England, they were similar in form to the medieval chair, but lacked storage underneath the seat. The wainscot chair, seen on page 142, was heavy and rectangular. It consisted of holly and bog oak, and it was used for the lord of the manor as he watched over the activities of the hall. The farthingale chair, seen on page 144, was an upholstered, armless chair widely used in the early 17th century. It accommodated the fashion for the extreme width of women's dresses. Upholstery was sometimes velvet or turkey work, which is a type of embroidery. And then there's the Yorkshire or Derbyshire chair, which was designed in the mid-17th century. It had either two crescent cross rails mounted between the styles of the back, or was characterized by the arcading between a cross rail above the seat level and cresting of the back. Storage pieces throughout this time were common in all three regions. The cassone or marriage chest was the most prized object in a home and it was a very elaborate with a hinged lid. There was also a credenza or a cupboard which was a significant piece of furniture and there was many varieties. Dining tables were introduced during this time and they were very ornately carved and decorated and they still had smaller tables that were used in the center of the room for occasional purposes. Beds during this time were constructed in many ways. There was the leto, which was on a raised platform or dais it had a paneled headboard, footboard, and platform used. Sometimes beds were surrounded on three sides by chests or benches. Textiles were significant treatments for beds, used different ones depending on the weather, and posters were still used. And they also hung textiles from a central support directly on the ceiling. The ornamentation during this time included arabesques, acanthus leaves, cartouches, grotesques, classical figures, egg and dart, bead and leaf, candelabra, and the grotesque. The grotesque comes from the Italian word grotesco, and they are created to provoke a sense of an uneasiness by blurring the boundaries between the natural and human-made worlds. This concludes our presentation on the European Renaissance. Next time we'll be talking about European Baroque.